First off, I just want to thank everybody uh, for being here this beautiful Sunday morning. Could have been anywhere, but you chose to be with us. And so we appreciate that. We know that you could have been to any of uh, these wonderful churches out here in Tampa. Could be enjoying the beach or be doing any number of things, but you, you decided to join us in, in worshiping our Savior. And so thank you for being here. We appreciate that. If you're new, my name is Marcio. I'm the, I'm the pastor here. Uh, and again, just want to thank you for joining us. Um, we all got here today. We all made it here today, but we all took a different path. Uh, some of you came down to 75, 75 north. Some of you guys made a right into this parking lot. Others made a left into this parking lot. Parking lot. We all came from different directions, but we all got here. And that's kind of like how life is, isn't it? We all come from our own stories, our own journeys, our own experiences. And yet there's something that led us uh, to church this morning. And that's what we're going to be diving into today is that necessary motive of, of why we do what we do as a believer. Why is it that you decided to come to Faith Endeavor this morning? Why is it that you decided to sing from your heart to the Lord? Why is it that you do what you do as a Christian? Why do you pray? Why do you read your Bible? The necessary motive of what we do as a believer. Amen? Amen. And we're all different. Uh, some of you guys struggle with things that your neighbor had never struggled with and they look at you and, and you open up and you share those struggles and the, your neighbor's like, man, that's so easy to deal with. Well, how, why do you struggle with that? And you could turn around and say the same thing to them. Why do you struggle with that? Like, I have no issue with that. That's, that's a breathe, brother. But, but, but we all come from different issues, different struggles, and yet we all serve the same God. And there's one spirit, there's one baptism, there's one salvation in Christ alone. Amen? Amen. Um, the question is, why? Why did you wake up this morning? Why did you come to this place? We all need to find that necessary motive. And, and that's what we'll be looking into. And to start off that conversation, I want to read you guys this one simple verse. Um, and it's such a powerful, just a power packed um, verse. In fact, this one verse is a whole story. This one verse is a whole parable. And it's found in Matthew chapter 13. Verse 44, and it says this. The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and covered up. Then in his joy, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, my God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your presence here, Lord God. We thank you for your word, this ancient scripture that was written thousands of years ago, Father. And we thank you for this one particular verse that was spoken by your, the Son of God walking on this earth, my God. I pray that you would enlighten our hearts and our minds to your truth, Lord. Just, just unpack this, un, uh, just reveal it to us uh, that, that it could sink deep and bring transformation in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. So in this one little verse, we have this whole parable, a whole story. And if I were to ask you, what that story is, what this verse is, in a nutshell, you would probably tell me something like, well, there's this guy who found a, a, a treasure uh, that he thought was so valuable that he was willing to sell all that he had, all that he had, go home, and, hey, ma, like, like everything on eBay, we're selling it all. The furniture, the cars, everything. Back then, they didn't have no cars. It was camels and <laughs> whatever, livestock. But we're selling everything. And, and, and his family was probably like, are you crazy? You know, what are you talking about? Uh, but he said, we're getting rid of it all because I found a treasure. I found a treasure that maybe we could convince the owner that if, if we just sell everything and give him all that we have, maybe he'll sell this land so we can have this treasure. Right. So you, you, you would tell me, you know, this is basically the synopsis. This is what's going on. What did he do? He sold all that he had. OK, and I think I think we, we read over this uh, too fast. Uh, he sold all that he had. OK, that's pretty crazy. I don't know if you've ever done anything like that or you found something so valuable that you wanted to sell something in your household. You wanted to get rid of everything to purchase this because you knew that this investment, you were going to strike it rich. You know, I don't know, Pat, he, he trades baseball cards and he's great at it. I don't know if he saw that one, the Hank Aaron or that one Willie Mays card or something. And he's like, maybe I have a shot. And he said, I'm going to sell my Honda Civic for this car. 
I don't know if you've ever done, I don't know if you guys ever found something so valuable in your life that you were willing to trade almost anything for. Maybe it was, a, maybe it was your, 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 your wife, your, your husband. And you were like, I will sell my car to get that diamond ring. I will do what I, whatever it takes to get this woman, to get this man, because you, you understand the value uh, in that person. Now, back then, there were no banks to deposit your cash. Uh, people didn't have digital money. Like today, they didn't uh, have all their money on a plastic card that they could just tuck away in their garments. Um, so what they did is they would put their jewels, they would put their gold coins, they would put pearls, they would put anything of value in these clay vessels, wrap it up in cloth and bury it in their property. So that if there were marauders, if there were uh, raiders, if there was an invasion from another country, robbers that were coming to steal your belongings, it was hidden and you were good. Maybe they'll get the cheap stuff, they'll get your silverware and stuff, but the treasure is buried. And so that's why this man stumbled and maybe there was erosion in the land and he saw something there and he went and he looked and he dusted off and he found this treasure and he hid it back under there. And he said, I am going to sell everything because he understood the value of what he had just found. Um, so now what was the motive behind the man in the story? What does it say? It's a very small verse, but every, everything is already there. It says that in his joy, in his joy, joy in what? In discovering that treasure, right? In his joy, he sold everything. Now, I don't want you to attempt to follow Christ with the wrong motive. Uh, you might say, but pastor, isn't that the goal to be following Christ? Yeah, 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 yeah. That is the, the point. But it's not wise if you're doing it out of guilt, out of obligation, out of fear, out of uh, trying to impress someone, you know, you're trying to get that girl. And if you just, I remember seeing that in, in youth group, there'll be young guys who just, they'll just be praying, praying hard. And then they'll look to see if they're being watched, you know, and the same thing, the girls will be worshiping God, worshiping God, and they'll be checking out the boy that they're interested in, you know, it, it's, it's in our nature, but, but that's our heart. It's, it's revealing of the motives that's within our heart. Is it because maybe, hopefully, that you are truly hungry for God? Is there inside, is something inside of you that craves his presence? Like you just want to be near him. Something inside of you that yearns to draw near to God. Sometimes I read things in my Bible that just causes me to pause. And I have to read that again and just stop. Like I might have a goal and say, I'm going to read through the book of Galatians or something. And I get to a verse and I'm like, did I just read that? Like, is this real? Is this true? Because if you're a believer, either you're like a believer or you're not. If you're a believer, that means you believe. And if you see something written in these scriptures, that's like, it just blows you away. Like, what? This is a promise for me? Like, is this real? Have you ever read something in the Bible like this can't be real? Like it, it, you look through Revelation, it says those who overcome will sit on the throne uh, uh, with the Lord. Like there's all these crazy promises and we just read through it like it's nothing. And it, it, it just goes one ear out the other. But if we believe it, like something has to revolutionize your, your heart. If it's truly true. I'm going to give you just a, 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 an example. I want to read this passage. Forgive me if it's, it's a little bit lengthy, but it's found in Colossians. And I challenge you guys, read through the book of Colossians. Just read through it slowly and prayerfully. And there's some things here I'm just going to give you just the, the flavor of the month, okay, of what I'm talking about. Colossians, we're going to look at chapter 1, verse 19 through 27. It says this, For it was the Father's good pleasure... For all the fullness to dwell in him. Who's him? Jesus, right? For all the fullness to dwell in him and through him to reconcile all things to himself. Having made peace through the blood of his cross, through him, I say, whether things on earth or things in heaven. And although you were formerly alienated and hostile in mind, engaged in evil deeds, Yet he has now reconciled you in his fleshly body through death 
in order to present you before him holy and blameless and beyond reproach. I mean, this is crazy. You are, you, we, we are sinners. We were alienated from God. In fact, it says that our minds were, were hostile to God. We were enemies of God. And in his body, what, what Christ did, did on the cross, he is now reconciling us, not only reconciling us, you know, making that, okay, now I'm a friend of God. On top of that, he's saying that you are now holy and blameless. And that's hard for us to really believe when we read these things. Because we go through our daily lives and we have the thoughts that we have. We, we, we have the things in our hearts that we're like, man, I'm just a rotten person sometimes when I'm driving in rush hour. You know, I'm just, a, you know, the things that, you know, my eyes want to be looking at. Man, I'm just a bad dude. You know, I just I can't resist that 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 extra burger. You know, like like there's so many things in our life that we just we have no control. And we look at ourselves and we're like, how can God, how can this be true? Holy and blameless? Like I could just count on my toes and hands the many things in the last 30 minutes that prove that I'm not holy and blameless. What's going on? Is this true or not that we read these things in the Bible? Let me continue because it doesn't stop there. It says, um, if indeed you continue in the faith, firmly established and steadfast and not moved away from the hope of the gospel that you have heard, which was proclaimed in all creation under heaven and of which I, Paul, was made a minister. Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake and in my flesh. I do my share on behalf of his body, which is the church and filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions. Of this church, I was made a minister according to the stewardship from God bestowed on me for your benefit so that I might fully carry out the preaching of the word of God. Listen now, that is the mystery which has been hidden from the past ages and generations and has now been manifested to his saints. Who are the saints? You, right? Not, not Pope John Paul, not Mary, no, Teresa. And, and, no, we're, we who believe are the saints of God. Amen. Um, Passage in general, but has now been manifested to his saints to whom God will to make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery. Listen, among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Christ in you, the hope of glory. When I read this, I paused and I said, is this real? Christ in me, like in me. The Bible says that when you put your trust in God, you become a new creature born again and that you are sealed with the spirit of God as your guarantee, almost like a deed, like you're, you're going to own that property. It's a guarantee until the, the day you, you see the Lord face to face. Christ in you. When you walk around and you go through your life, are you conscious of this promise and this truth? Do you believe it? Christ in you. The hope of of glory. Wow. Do you delight in that truth? Christ in you, the hope of glory. You know, we don't meditate on these type of things enough. If we did, if we did I think our, our, our faith would be so robust. And the scriptures has said in, in, in the book of John 7, 38, rivers of living water will flow from within them. You know, what does that talk about? It's talking about that joy of having that understanding of that truth. Christ in you, the, the hope of glory. You see, this type of joy can't be bought for any price. Can't pay money for this joy. It can't be found in any other resource but Christ himself. It's so important for each of us to ask ourselves, why do we even want Christ? Why do we even want to grow in Christ? So I want you to take a moment, evaluate why do you desire Christ? Why do you even desire him? Why do you desire to grow in Christ? What is it inside of you that tells you this is necessary? Like, I, I need Jesus. I, I need to draw near to God. Like, I, I, I want to, to know him more. If your motivation isn't God glorifying, then it's time to reevaluate your motives and, and your reasons. Most Christians fail at this thing that we call discipleship, right? Where consistent spiritual growth. Um, and and, and for, for one of two reasons. Number one, they follow Jesus out of duty rather than delight. 
They follow Jesus out of duty rather than delight. This is di different. This is the difference between I have to follow Jesus and I get to follow Jesus. OK, some see it as an obligation instead of an opportunity. They say God is going to be mad at me or, or, or other believers are going to be mad at me if I'm not showing that I'm obeying Christ's words. Or, you know, they're going to judge me. Uh, you feel you have to instead of you get to. You get to know your creator. Like, that's crazy. You get to know the one who designed all the intricacies, all the beautiful details of this universe. When you look and you go where there's no, you know, sky pollution and you can see the stars. I remember when I was young and I was in Chile and I was on my grandfather's house one night and it's out there and, you know, in the middle of nowhere by the beach. And he had these old binoculars and I went, I got, grabbed his old binoculars and I started just gazing out into space and over there in Chile I mean they have some crazy telescopes and stuff for that reason uh, because number one the lack of air pollution right you can see um, I could not come close to counting the amount of stars that I it was just beautiful and to think that our God created all this and in the middle of all this this one little earth um, where life is possible and where you and I breathe and exist. And, you know, you start thinking about this and you, 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 you start to stop and realize he's inviting you into a relationship with him. And we just pass over that truth like it's nothing. The creator, the great creator, he's inviting you into a relationship with him. Um, it's, it's amazing. Um, number two, they delight in something else more than Jesus. They delight in something else more than Jesus. We constantly allow all kinds of different idols to make their residence in our heart, right? Um, Pastor Lowe, he always talks about that verse, uh, that, that quote by Calvin, um, that, our, that our hearts are like, uh, yeah, they, they, that's all they do. They're like these factories, these idol factories, always creating these, these idols in our hearts. Uh, might be relationships with, with uh, money, uh, relationships, it might be money. Uh, it might even be worrying. You ever meet somebody who's like a full time warrior like they wish that the university had a degree program in anxiety because they would be like they would be a doctor by now. They would have doctor in their title because they would get straight A's in worrying. For a lot of people, there isn't enough room on the throne of their hearts for Jesus to be the joy of our lives because you're constantly chasing other pleasures that they see as being more joyful. They see the potential of that pleasure as potentially bringing more pleasure than Christ himself. If arriving to a theme park, going through the traffic, going through, getting into, finding a parking lot, walking in the heat, in this Florida heat, and waiting on them lines brings, is easier for you to do than to come to a Sunday service. Listen, you don't have an obedience problem. You have a joy problem. You have a joy problem. Preach. If you are more fearful of what a crowd of people think or say than what God does, you don't have an obedience problem. You have a, a joy problem because your, your, your source of pleasure, your source of joy is what those people think of you. And then when it comes to what God calls you to, the life, the joy that he's calling you to, you could care less. You might have heard something like this in your Christian walk. Even if you don't feel like obeying God, you still do it. Right. It's kind of like uh, you might have heard fake it till you make it. All right. Uh, or, or, or smile for a while, even if you don't want to walk that extra mile. You probably didn't hear that one. I just made that one up. Uh, and, and that might be true to a certain extent. But 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 if you're following Jesus and doing the right things, but you're miserable about it, you might not understand what you're actually even doing. And you might have the wrong intentions about it. All right. Because when you do the right thing with the wrong motive, uh, most likely you're doing the wrong thing. OK, let's imagine there was a couple here in our congregation. Um, I don't want to throw out any names. We'll just say it's Tommy and Betsy. OK, and, and when Tommy and Betsy, they first started dating and, and stuff. Tommy was such a gentleman, always keeping that door open for her, always bringing her in the car and closing it after her and, you know, holding her hand, being very gentleman like always buying flowers for Betsy. Every every week was a different flower. Sometimes it would be a bouquet. Uh, sometimes it would just be a single rose. Sometimes he would get her a card and inside that card he would put dried up wildflowers and she opened up and it's just beautiful, like wow, like this guy's on another level, man. It's just consistent, like 
just whirlwind of, of, of Aladdin and Jasmine type love. You know what I'm talking about? And then they get married and some time goes by and the flowers stop, right? And they're there watching Netflix, watching the movie, just chilling and, and, and uh, in the movie, it's a romantic movie. So the guy's like, he's like trying to stay up, watch this romantic movie. And, she, and, and Betsy's like, and there's a scene where, where this, this couple, you know, the guy's giving her flowers in the movie. And Betsy's like, I remember when you used to do that stuff to me, right? Now, now my man T Tommy, he's in a bit of a dilemma. Because if he goes and gets her flowers, what's she gonna think? Exactly. The motive behind him getting is, oh, if I didn't say nothing, he would have never got me these flowers, right? So Tommy's like in his dilemma. And, and even worse, <laughs> if Tommy decides to do it like this, here, is this what you wanted? You happy now? I got you your flowers, right? Okay, I got you what you wanted. Now, can I have one drama-free week? Can you, can you give me what I want? Right? Yo, he might as well throw those flowers in the trash, okay? Because Betsy's not going to be having that, all right? That's how some of us treat God with our obedience. Here, God, see, I did what you call me to do. I did what you were expecting. I did what you commanded me to do. I did what you want me to do, God. Now, where's my blessing? Where's the things that I've been asking you for? Take note of this verse, highlight it, memorize it, write it down somewhere, put a sticky note on your computer. Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 47 and 48. Listen to, listen to what the Lord says. Listen to the heart behind this, okay? He says this, because you did not serve the Lord your God with what? And because you did not serve the Lord your God with joy and a glad heart for the abundance of all things, listen, therefore you shall serve your enemies whom the Lord will send against you in hunger and thirst and nakedness and in the lack of all things. And he will put an iron yoke on your neck until he has destroyed you. Wow, that's harsh. Now, this is, this is what he's speaking to his covenant people, Israel, whom he's redeemed out of Egypt. And he's, he, you know, he's, he's shown them he wants, he's inviting them into this unique, you know, particular relationship with him. But listen to this strong rebuke. And the heart, be, you can hear God's heart. He says, because you did not serve the Lord your God with joy and a glad heart. And understand, in, in other words, he's pointing out their, their, their motives. He's like, listen, this is not about a, a, a religious thing that, you know, if you do this, then you're going to get my approval. You're not getting the point. You missed it. You didn't see it. Like, you didn't see it. Like, I'm, I love you more than anything. I took you out of slavery, and now you're worshiping other gods. Like, this idolatry is, is, is spiritual idolatry. I, I am your, I want to be your God. I want to be your redeemer. I want this relationship. And you're turning it into something that it's never supposed to be. And that's how sometimes we go through this life. And the Lord is like, listen, I love you. You know, that's why a lot of times the gospel and, and this, our redemption is compared to this mystery of marriage. You know, like, like this, this covenant, this commitment that's based in, in love and in faithfulness and trust. Like once you get married and you, ha you have a little bit more of that understanding, you can kind of get a, a picture. And it's such a faint shadow of what it really is. But you didn't do it with joy. I'm not talking about being emotional or just trying to appear uh, being emotional like you can fake it with God. You might be able to fake your neighbor, but you don't got to fake that you truly love God with your neighbor, uh, with God. He sees, he sees our heart for what it really is. Um, we need to lead our emotions, not be led by them. Amen. The person that finds delight in something other than Jesus doesn't comprehend who he really is. It might not necessarily be bad things, but if you delight in them more than than Christ, examine this. What is the greatest delight in your life right now? What is where where is it that you find the most pleasure in your life right now? Sometimes you can go through your Facebook page and, and, and I'm guilty of this. You could probably go through my Facebook page. Not that I use Facebook very often. And the majority of what I post are like pictures of my family and stuff, family. And you might say, well, your family is very important to Marcio. 
you might always be posting stuff of your, your favorite car, your, your, you know, your, something that you strive to attain and you, you know, all this stuff and, and you just look and you be like, that's very important to that person. They want to succeed. They want to attain this or that. And you know, I, had a, I, I tested myself because it's like, I, I, I can't come up here and preach without, I, I want to get an idea. And, and you know what? Sometimes the best way to find out where you really are is you ask a child. Because <laughs> the kid's going to tell you straight up. So I said, Zaya, call my daughter. I said, come here. And I'm sitting at my table, my kitchen table. And I said, she's watching her cartoons. I said, Zaya, what do you think brings Poppy the most amount of joy? And I could have sworn she was going to say me, <laughs> you know, or, or, or um, Maple, my dog. <laughs> you know, I could have sworn she was going to say Maple or maybe number three, maybe food or mommy. You know, I don't know. I'm thinking I'm going to get one of those four things. But you know what she told me? God. She told me God. And I, and I, I don't want to sound private or arrogant like, please, please. I'm not trying to say that. But it, it was like, wow. Like, she sees that. You know, she sees that, like, Poppy has joy because of God. And, 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 you know, I tried to talk to her about the beauty of God. And the way I do it with my daughter is because she's, that's what she's into is through science, uh, nature, and things like that. And we'll be driving in the car, and we'll t I'll start talking about that stuff. And just, you know, how awesome God is as the creator and all this stuff. Zaya, did you know that if the earth was just like a foot, just inches uh, farther than the sun, we would all melt, could we, we, we would freeze. Or if we were just a few inches closer to the sun, um, we would all burn. All vegetation would be burned up and we would die of famine and all. And I would just go into the detail how God was just so precise in his design and creation. And I would just, you know, I'm not an apologist and I don't know, I'm not a scientist. But what I know, what I can uh, as far as that, I, I'll communicate it to her in a very nerdy way. I make sure I speak real nerdy because she watches these shows where these kids who are very nerdy, they'll talk about this stuff and she's enthralled. It captivates her. And so when she sees my passion for God, she knows that where my, my, the source of my joy is coming from, the source of my pleasure. We could talk about insects, but I'm letting her know that my source of my joy is from the creator of that, that bug. I love this verse. The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and covered up. Then in his joy, he goes and sell, sells all that he has and buys that field. What if that was you, that you were walking down the street and you found that treasure chest maybe behind some bushes or whatever on the side of the road and you were walking down and, and you looked inside and it's full of gold, like over 200 pounds of it. And you, you know, it was just an empty lot. Nothing was growing there. They weren't building nothing. Um, this guy, he's willing to sell all that he owns. Everything, every, everything he owns. And give the owner of that field all that money, everything, everything. All my, all my current land, all my, my possessions, my, my extra clothing, my furniture, whatever I have, my animals, everything. And here's the key. Jesus said in his joy. The man just wanted to get that land so he can get the treasure chest and say, now this is mine. This is mine. If your version of Christianity is this miserable submission instead of a glorious opportunity, you're missing what true Christianity is all about. You don't have to be kind. You get to be kind. You don't have to be faithful to your wife. You get to be faithful to your wife. You don't have to be generous. You get to be generous. You don't have to go on missions trips. You get to go on missions trips. Like this is, this is our privilege. This is our honor. This is our joy. If the greatest, if Jesus is the greatest delight of my life, no offering to him could ever be seen as a burden. Because we can, we can leave things behind because we get him. I can, I can leave this behind. When, I, when we were doing mission trips, my and I, we left a lot of things behind. We sold the car, we got rid of all it, we gave away furniture, we gave everything behind. We can do those things because we were chasing Jesus. You can leave things behind if you get him. And I'm not saying by sacrificing or doing, you, is how you get him. I'm not saying that you could sell any amount of things uh, and, and, and any amount of money can purchase him. That's not what, the, what this parable is getting at. 
Psalm 73, verse 25. Whom do I have in heaven but you? And besides you, I desire nothing on earth. Is that like a deep cry in your heart when it really comes down to it? And you really consider, man, you could strip this away. You could strip it. You can take as much as important as this is, as much as I've invested in this thing. I can live without it if I have you. It, can you really say it? Listen, Jesus is the greatest treasure I have, but that doesn't mean we can't enjoy earthly treasures and gifts that God grants us. Uh, I'm going to love my wife, but I'm going to love her best. When, when Christ is on the throne in my heart, you'll approach hard tasks. You, you'll do it with joy if you have, if you have value in, in what you get out of it, right? How many people here will work a full-time job for a dollar a month? $10 a month, $100 a month, $1,000 a month. A lot of you guys are like, nah, as much as I work, $1,000, you got to do better than that. But if the reward, if you value the reward at the end, you will do that thing with joy. That's why they say, if you love what you do, you don't work a day in your life. Because if you value what you're getting out of it, you do it with joy. You, do it, you joyfully do that thing. Some people here have New Year's resolutions. Some of you got on a diet. Some of you guys got gym memberships. Um, some failed, most likely because you saw it as a misery. Uh, uh, or your motive was just to look good for someone else. And, and then when that someone else like disappeared out of the picture, you're like, ah, forget this gym membership. <laughs> right? A lot of people got, get stagnant in their relationship with Christ and they assume it's a discipline problem, but more likely than not, it's a joy problem. They say, you know, if you enjoy your job, you're not going to work a day in your life. Listen, Jesus taught that a wise person counts the cost before jumping into something. All right, he gave that parable about the king about to enter into battle. He counts the cost. Like, it, you know, am I going to win this battle? Is it worth, is it worth this? You know, if you're going to buy a property, you got to, you got to count the cost. Like, is it worth this investment? You got to count the cost. Knowing Jesus is finding a treasure, not accomplishing a task. Some people walk through this faith journey like, like um, their uh, Ulysses or Odysseus. Um, from Homer's Odyssey. Anybody remember that reading that in high school? Odyssey? Come on, don't tell me. You know, or at least seen the movie, right? Where you got to complete these tasks. You know, you got to, you got to, uh, don't listen to the sirens when you're out on sea. Uh, what, what was the other one? You got you to survive the cyclops. Um, you got, don't, don't look at Medusa. You got to chop off Medusa's head. You got to go through this, this journey in life and you got to accomplish all these things for Jesus and accomplish all these tasks and these goals. That's not what it is. It's not about completing tasks because then the motive is ourselves and our accomplishments and what we're doing. And you might say, but pastor, I'm do doing these things for God. I'm doing these things for the kingdom. That's great. But what really is your motive? Is it an outflowing of the joy you have in Christ? Is that where it's coming from? Is the source, is the fountainhead the joy you have in Christ? Or is it to stroke your own ego or out of fear that you don't, you know, if you don't do the thing, God is going to disapprove of you for some reason. Some of you might be asking, so where is this treasure chest? It's him. It's Christ plus nothing. It's him. In the thought of getting to know him, if the thought of getting to know him more doesn't create a desire to read and discover more about him, uh, if that's not sufficient, then I don't know what is. I can't convince you more than that. How will you place Jesus upon the throne of your heart? What would that look like? Is he the foundation, the fountainhead of where all the pleasures and, and, and joy come from? Or is he just something peripheral? Um, something that you got on the sidelines? I... Um, Listen to this. The reason you want to grow in Christ will determine the level of your success as a Christian. Remember, success as a Christian will not look the same as success in the world. Right. Success in the world is 
how much, you've, how much money you've attained, how, you know, your position, your title, all this, your academics, all this stuff, how many followers you have on social media, all accolades, all that stuff. Success as a Christian equates to peace, joy, love, and obedience to God. That's success as a Christian. If you, can, if you have those things in your life, you're a successful Christian. Because those things only come in and through Christ. Not of yourself and your own work. It's what Christ has already accomplished on the cross. Is what he promises you when you reside in him, when you abide in him. John Piper created a ministry called Desiring God. He talks about this thing that, you know, first time I, I really was into this back in the day. I got all his books and he, he calls it Christian hedonism. And the first time I read that, I was like, whoa, what does this brother talk about? Christian hedonism. But then he explains it and it made sense. And I'm like, wow, you know, when your source of pleasure and delight and joy is in God. You know, when you can't get enough of him, when you're hedonistic, when it comes to the Lord, that's, that's, that's a good place to be. And we always think that, you know, hedonism, well, that's just so selfish and it's all this thing. But when it brings glory to God, when the thing is, yo, God, you are so good. I can't get enough of you. That's a different story. Because God's like, duh, I know. I know that. That's what I'm trying to tell you. Um, uh, I shared all this with you today to get this one truth through to you, which is that Jesus should be our pleasure and our privilege. Because here's the irony of the parable. There's nothing we could sell. There's no amount of money that we could collectively come up with to buy and pay for what Christ already paid for himself. The life, death and resurrection of Jesus Christ and that ultimate promise of our redemption in him is the most valuable treasure you could possibly ever encounter in this life, lifetime. You're not going to find a greater treasure. I know it. I promise you. I know I'm only 41 years old, but I know there's no other treasure. There's nothing that money could buy. There's no relation. There's nothing. I just know. I don't have to live another 40 years. I know. I know. Jesus is the greatest treasure that you can ever have because this world can't give you peace like Jesus can. He can't give you, this world can't give you true joy, lasting joy like Jesus can. He, it, you're not going to find it. I promise you. I promise you. And I believe that when by the power of the Holy Spirit, this truth truly sinks into your hearts, you will rejoice because you would have grasped the fact that if you attained all the worldly possessions, all the money, all the houses and cars and, and health money could buy because health, right? You need a good insurance plan uh, to purchase that health. Um, all those things. Um, e even if you gave more to charity than, than Bill Gates, you know, that, the, the sense of reward that it is to give and all. Even if that was the case, none of that, none, none even all of it makes your life even more meaningful, more purposeful, more pleasurable than knowing Jesus. None of that, even collectively, all together, if you had all those things, it can't compare to knowing him. I don't know if you believe that. Knowing Jesus and being with him is better than any life you could possibly imagine or even design for yourself. Like if you were to stop and, and try to dream up the ideal life, uh, it can't possibly even compare to what it, what it would be to really know Jesus and to be with Jesus for all of eternity. And I want to end with this. And this is why Paul in Ephesians chapter one, verse 17, he prays. This is a prayer from the Apostle Paul. He says this over the, uh, the Ephesians. I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. You know, a lot of people read this verse and they say, you know, the spirit of wisdom and revelation. And they caught up and they're like, I want the spirit of wisdom and revelation. I want this mysterious power to know things and, and discern the mysteries of God. What is the context of this prayer? I pray that God will give you the spirit of knowledge, the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. So that you may know Jesus. Not so that you could be some lofty prophet and declare cr crazy stuff. So that you could know your Redeemer, know your Savior more than anything else. That was Paul's prayer over this church that he, is, he had toiled so hard. He had worked so hard for, sacrificing his own body for this church. That was his prayer, that they would know Jesus more than anything else. 
And so right where you're at right now, I want you guys just to stand to your feet with me. And I want you guys, man, I've been asking you guys throughout the sermon just to examine these things in your life. And take a moment to just examine your heart. Listen, um, this, the gospel is so, so beautiful. It's um, the promise of deliverance, of redemption and relationship with a God who, who loves you. Uh, we don't deserve that love. We don't deserve any of that. And listen, there's nothing that we can ever do to earn that love or make him love us any more or less. Um, it, 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 it's been established and proven on the cross. As Jesus said, I love you. This is what I, I, I've done. I paid for your sins. I paid for your sins. I paid for your sins. He overcame sin. He overcame death. And sometimes we overlook these truths like it's, you know, we hear it so often and it, go, and it just, you know, doesn't really impact us. But this message is what should be transformative in your life. Because if we really, really, really believed it and, and, and accepted it for the truth that it is, man, joy should be bubbling up. Because if you, if you see yourself for who you truly are, a sinner, and that's why Jesus said, you know, unless you come to me like a little child. That's why that, that young rich ruler, he went away sad, you know, because he thought he, he had it all and did it all. That he was perfect. He obeyed the, the commandment and he walked away sad because he's standing before his creator, the, the one that he's called good. And Jesus says, well, who's good? Only God is good, right? Right. And in a few moments later, he's walking away sad because he was unable to obey what the only good one, Jesus, God, was commanding of him. He was not able to see Jesus as that treasure, that he could walk away from his treasure. God is everything, man. Jesus is, is everything. And there's, there's, if we have him, we have it all. That's the truth. You know, everything else is a cherry on top. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, once again, we just thank you for this day. We thank you for the opportunity we could just come, fellowship, um, lift up your name, uh, hear your word. Uh, Father, I pray that if there be anybody here in this room, my God, um, that perhaps uh, they've been doing things out of the wrong motivation. Perhaps it's just out of spirit of obligation, out of fear, um, out of a desire to impress or, or stroke their ego uh, Father, I pray that you remind them of your love and of what you've already accomplished on the cross, uh, what you've already done. There's nothing that we can do on our own or even collectively as a group uh, to accomplish what you've already done, my God. We can't purchase this redemption. We can't purchase this relationship, this salvation. There's nothing we could do, uh, Father God. It is, it's what you've done. I pray that that would liberate us. Father, I pray that if we've been burdened, if we've been carrying this heavy yoke uh, of guilt, uh, of our sin, Father, that we would just surrender that, that we would lay it down at your cross, that we would see what you did for what it truly is, the, the, the power of, of that gospel message, my God. Uh, let it be real in our hearts and in our minds, Father God. Um, let that freedom, Father, bring joy, bring pleasure, and let that be our motivation of why we do what we do. I pray for each person here, Lord God, anybody who might be dealing with worry or anxiety, depression. We know that this is not a small thing. We, we pray for each person who is going through their struggles. Um, Lord, we pray that you minister to them, uh, that you would draw near to them and that they would draw near to you, that they would find solace and comfort in your presence, that they would find peace in your promises, Lord God. Speak to their heart, Lord God, as an individual like only you can. Um, Remind them of your love and your purposes, my God. We love you, Father. We pray for the remainder of this day uh, that as we leave this place, we wouldn't leave your presence, um, but that you would protect us, that you would continue to minister to us and, and transform us and to be more like your son, Jesus. Lord, we love you in Jesus' name. And everybody says, amen. God bless you guys.